like, you know, God makes us lie down in green pastures. And that just struck a nerve, or struck a chord of me, because it's, in, in my heart of hearts, it's so hard to believe that God wants to bless me. That, like, God looks at me and he wants to prosper me. And it, it, it immediately made me think of these scriptures, of, like, when David sinned with Bathsheba and he killed Uriah, and how Nathan rebukes David, and he says, um, and, he, and he's speaking on behalf of God, I gave you all Israel and Judah, and if this, and if all this had not been too little, I would have given you even more. Or in Jeremiah 3, it says, uh, How gladly would I treat you like my children, and give you a pleasant land the most beautiful inheritance of any nation. Or Luke 12, where it says, Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Oh, that just, just came to my mind just now, and I wanted to share it with you guys. It just, uh, it just blows my mind, like how, good, like, how good God is. Amen? How good is our God? How he wants to prosper us. He wants us to be close to Him. He wants to bless us. And not just to have a relationship with Him, but for us to enjoy life. Amen? That just blows my mind. Come on, Brian. Well, I hope you guys are doing well today. Um, I've been doing great the past few days, staying at the Vargas's, um, being well-fed. They have the, they, Their hospitality was incredible. I was a poor wing stranger. You know, I was a, a, an alien sojourning in a foreign nation, and, and they took me in, and I was well taken care of by Diego's company and by Blanca's masterful cooking, and, and uh, it was a wonderful time. I became a soccer fan, you know, was, uh, for the weekend, for the weekend. Uh, Diego, Diego and I were watching the, the UEFA Champions League finals, and Real Madrid took home the cup, and it was fun to watch it, and it just laughing about how this is a sport that will never catch on in America the way it does in other nations because it's just like the game ends at 2-0 like that is just so it, at least if they made the goals 10 points then it would be a little bit more exciting you know but uh, yeah man <laughs> so uh, I think uh, um, I would like for my wife to have a few more of these retreats I like going to the Vargas <laughs> so I'll be doing mine um Next week, um, on uh, this Saturday, I'll be heading out to Houston for a few days, going to a biblical study seminar um, with my favorite scholar. He does one every summer, this uh, like a four-day long intensive, and it might be his last one because he's like 75. Um, so I'm very excited. He's going to do it on the book of Ephesians, and then when I come back, we're going to scrap the Matthew series and go to Ephesians. All right. No, I'm just kidding. No. But. Uh, so, like I said, we, we started a series in the Gospel of Matthew, and hopefully we're going to be learning some new things and reminded of some old ones, uh, that, uh, that we're going to look at Jesus and be changed. And we're going to come into contact with Jesus and be healed. That we're going to hear His words and be challenged to respond, maybe live up to being a kingdom of God community. Amen? Amen. Amen. So as I suggested last week, one way of summing up the Gospel of Matthew in one sentence is that Jesus is the promised King come to set us free and bring the Kingdom of God. And Matthew's Gospels, you can kind of think of it as like an apologetic to the Jews. That Jesus was in fact the promised Son of David Son of God, anointed one, the promised Messiah King. Jesus was the King, is the King. He did, in fact, liberate God's people. So as we journey through the Gospel of Matthew together in these next few months, we're going to have the Kingdom of God prophetically pronounced over us. Week in and week out. Over waypoint. Over Santa Barbara, amen? Amen. And these first few messages, this one and the next one, um, which will not be next week because next week I'll be out of town. We're going to have Gio Garces come up and bless us with some uh, with the, the message. And then the week after is Father's Day, so we'll have some father sharing. Um, and then, then the week after that we'll get back into Matthew. But these first few lessons is going to be laying the groundwork, laying the foundation. 
It is going to be helping us see the entire Gospel of Matthew. And, uh, and, I, and if you didn't listen, or you weren't here last week, I recommend that you go back and listen to the message. So, because we looked at the introduction. We looked at Matthew's genealogy of Jesus, and far from being a boring list of names, come on, David, it's not a boring list of names. It is this dramatic drum roll announcing the, that the entire biblical story has reached its climax in the birth of the coming promised king. We learn from the genealogy that God is faithful to his promises. Even when we aren't. And how Jesus takes on the role in the Gospel of Matthew as a new Moses, as the teacher of God's will to his people. <laughs> That he is the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham for innumerable descendants that are going to be his vehicle for blessing the world. That he is like a new David whose kingship brings the ultimate fulfillment of the promise made to, da uh, to David in 2 Samuel 7 that his heir would be called the Son of God and would sit on his throne and have this everlasting kingship and build a temple for his people. So today, we are going to get into the Christmas story. Come on. And we are still in the first section of the Gospel of Matthew, the preparation of the king. We're still in his introduction, which is why these next messages are really important for understanding the Gospel of Matthew. So we're looking at the Christmas story. It's kind of like, you know, Christmas in July, we're celebrating Christmas in June. Amen? Okay. So we're going to be looking at the Christmas story. And this passage is full of God moments. Full of moments where God shows up and he just does his thing. And if you're not already there, you can turn to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. And it reads, Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph... But before they lived together, she was found to be pregnant from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to divorce her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Amen. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had given birth to a son and he named him Jesus. God is with us. Amen? Amen. And the Christmas story in Matthew, it's order, organized around these five Old Testament fulfillments. And Matthew has 11 of these throughout the Gospel. And five of them are concentrated right here in Matthew 1 and 2. Eleven times he has this, and five of them are right here. And, and we'll get into, in a moment, exactly what, what it means for him to be fulfilling these scriptures. But, but five of them are concentrated right here at the beginning at Jesus' birth. And it shows God's involvement in everything going on. Amen. God is involved in everything going on. Whether we see him or not, whether we recognize him or not, whether or not it's miraculous, God is involved. Amen. Amen. And uh, Joseph and Mary, they were... Pledged to be married. It's a little bit more than, than what we would call being engaged. It, it, the traditions surrounding Jewish marriages are a little different than the way we do things today. But the point is that, that Joseph and Mary would have been considered husband and wife for all intents and purposes in the eyes of God. Um, and if you're curious about all the nuances of that, I'd be happy to explain it to you in more depth. But the point is that they would have been seen as married for all intents and purposes. And Joseph was a righteous man. So he planned to divorce Mary in keeping with the expectations because she, he, I mean, it looked like she was an adulterer, so he would have been expected to divorce her. 
But also because he was a righteous man, he wanted to do so quietly and not subject her to shame or further shame in public humiliation. And Joseph is righteous in both the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. Amen? Amen. Except Mary wasn't an adulteress. Her pregnancy was miraculous. I mean, you can't blame Joseph for thinking otherwise. What she conceived was by the Holy Spirit. And God communicates to Joseph three times with an angel and once through a dream. God was explicitly directing and guiding these events to take place in a particular way. And, and it's important to know that this is unusual. I mean, God is always active in our lives. But the way I understand the will of God is that it is not always this specific and narrow as it is right here. God was so clear in the case of Joseph here that because he was the birth of the Messiah that we're talking about. So it, we don't need to feel this sense, I think, of, oh, well, I don't see God speaking to me in dreams, and I don't have God, angels showing up to my life, like, does God not love me? Am I not a real Christian? Is God not speaking to me? Is not God not in my life? What's going on? You know, no, you don't need to feel that insecurity. Amen. We don't need to feel lost if God isn't making every decision crystal clear to us. Because sometimes I think His will is like, is like being given a canvas to paint on with simple yet ambiguous instructions. It's like God's will is like being told to paint a mountain landscape in spring. But we get to choose whether we'll use oil or water-based paint. We choose the colors. We choose the time of day that the painting is depicting. We choose if it's a desert mountain landscape or a Himalayan or a Colorado. God wants us, in His will, to love Him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. To love our neighbor as ourselves, to be devoted to one another. He wants us to be devoted to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers, and to make disciples of all nations. That is the will of God for your life. And there's like a lot of wiggle room in there of what that can look like for you personally. And I think God, what He wants to do is He wants to do life with us. Amen. Not hand out top-down orders of do this and do this, and if you don't get the perfect formula that you missed my will and you're outside of my will and you're outside of my blessing. God, if that were the case, God would be making it very clear every single thing he wanted you. He'd hand you instructions and a text message every morning. <laughs> Other times, God's will is very specific. And when it is, he makes that clear to those who are willing to listen. Sometimes it's just clear in scripture. The, what you're doing is sinful. God does not want this. What you're doing is hurting yourself and bringing brokenness into your life. And sometimes we stop our ears to it. Or, you know, God, why don't you lead me? So Joseph is told not to be afraid to take Mary as his wife and that he's to name the child. God right here has a very specific plan in place. And what is that plan? It's to bring salvation to his people. To be faithful to his promises. Amen? Amen. And he, Joseph is told to name the child. The, the reason I think he's told to do this when I was studying was it is so that uh, Joseph is accepting Jesus as his legal heir. Because the husband names the child. And by Joseph naming the child... He is saying, yes, this is my son. This son is my heir. And he is going to be a son of David. And Matthew, you hear kind of a little bit of the apologetic that Matthew is putting in there. Jesus is the genuine son of David. And the angel makes clear, though, that the, the salvation that Jesus is going to bring them is not political restoration like they were hoping for. But spiritual reconciliation and revival. Amen. Even the most righteous Jews were misguided as to what 
Jesus was trying to accomplish. What God's will is. And it's the same for us. We need to be humble and allow ourselves to constantly be discipled by God. Amen? Amen. Jesus is never as simple as we like to conceptualize him. He never fits into the boxes we try to put him into. I haven't found a big enough box to put him into. He always challenges our expectations. And I trust most of you agree with me on this. If not all of you, but, but we should not let that cause us to think that we've got Jesus figured out because we're disciples. Someone who, let's take someone over here, who loves evangelism and loves the mission and, and, and might be thinking that anyone who doesn't quite see things that way is going to be challenged by Jesus if they read the Gospels of how much or how important the mission is integral to what Jesus is about. And yes, that is true. People on the other side, who, who, on the other side, who are looking at the, the evangelism junkies and the evangelists and, and perhaps disdain them because they fail to see the incredible importance of spiritual formation and loving people where they're at and, and being responsive to people's needs and being champions of justice in the church and in the world. Those people are going to be equally challenged by Jesus. No one's safe. No one's safe to have their expectations be defined. We need to constantly be open to God reshaping and forming us, molding us. Amen. Neither person would have a full view of Jesus. No one is safe from having their expectations shaken upside down. So we need to all approach him with humility. Certainty is the enemy of humility. That's a quote from Ryan Kelly about that. So the, the angel says to him that Jesus is going to save his people from their sins. And we need to understand what he's saying there. What, that's, a, that's a really loaded statement. Because when we read that, we might think, oh yeah, Jesus is going to make my sins forgiven so that I can have a relationship with God and go to heaven. That is not what anyone in the first century would have ever understood if you were to say that statement. Because Israel was God's chosen people. And remember the story of Israel. They came out of Egypt... They wander the desert, they come into the promised land, and then they mess it up to be God's holy people. And they get carted off into exile, like the covenant warned if they were wicked. And God said to Jeremiah that this exile is going to last 70 years. Fast forward 70 years, it's about to be time to go back home. Daniel is praying to God, and, Dan, and, and the angel says to Daniel, did God say 70? I think, actually, he meant to say 70 times 7. It's like, what? What are you talking about? Yeah, the exile is going to last 490 years. It's going, to be, it's going to be a lot longer than 70 years. But then they are taken back to the promised land. And it's like this spiritual exile is hanging over their heads over their entire history. From the time of the Babylonian exile to them being returned in the day of Ezra and Nehemiah around 500 BC, give or take 50 years, 100 years. That was 500 years until Jesus and only 100 of those years were they free. It was they were passed around between empire and empire. In the hundred years that they were free, the leaders of God's people were not righteous. It was the Maccabees. And that's actually where the Pharisees came from. It was calling out the Maccabees for being an unrighteous leadership of the, of the nation. So they are waiting for God to save them from their sins. For God to rescue them from exile. Because of her sin, Israel's story got stuck in Babylon. 
They were geographically brought home, but it, they had a sort of domestic exile after that because Persia was still ruling over them. And then the Egyptians ruled over them. And then the Greeks ruled over them. And then they had a little bit of time where they were free under the Maccabees. But then Rome came in and was over them. They were spiritually still in Babylon. The exile continued. And Jesus was coming to bring that sin-caused exile to an end. That's why the first words off the lips of Jesus' Or off the, the words off of Jesus' lips in the Gospel of Mark is the time has been fulfilled. The kingdom of God is arriving. Repent and believe the good news. Sometimes we get stuck. Sometimes we get stuck emotionally after a trauma or a painful circumstance. And we can't move past it in our hearts. And we carry it with us and it prevents us from living full, free lives. Jesus came to save us from our sins. To save us from exile. Amen. Amen. For me, that, that saved me from brown eating. The end of Waypoint's exile has come. Talking about the kingdom of God being proclaimed over this church as we as we read the Gospel of Matthew. Well, the kingdom of God is arriving in Santa Barbara. Waypoint's exile is coming to an end. Amen. So repent, Waypoint, and believe the good news. Believe it. Have faith. I need to be rescued from my sins. I am an expert sinner. I am so good at it. There's nothing I do better than sinning. Just ask my wife. <laughs> I'm selfish. I'm stubborn. I am incredible. Like, when I want something, there is nothing that's going to get in the way of me getting what I want. I am incredibly stubborn. When conflict arises, I get fearful and self-doubting, and I flop and I fold. And I get tempted to play both ends. My name is Brian, and I'm a sinner. Hi, <laughs> Brian. We are sinners in need of a Savior. Amen? The angel says that Jesus, all this happened, was a fulfillment of what was said in the prophet Isaiah. It says that the, the, the virgin will, give, uh, will conceive and give birth and they will call him an annual. And it's important to understand, what does he mean by fulfillment? Is he saying, this prophecy, this was a prediction made by Isaiah 700 years ago, and now it is finally coming true. That's how I grew up thinking about fulfillment of prophecy. That is not what fulfillment means. What fulfillment means is that what Jesus is doing or undergoing Echoing what already happened. Okay. So in the context of Isaiah, the, the, the prophecy was given in the 8th century. And it was referring to a child who was about to be born, like in a year or two, from Isaiah. And before, and while the child was still a baby, the time uh, God would be bringing a swift end to his enemies. And Matthew is saying, guys, the same sort of thing. It's happening right here. And shortly thereafter, Herod dies. There wasn't like this um, long, agreed upon, clear scripture bank of predictions for the coming Messiah. You couldn't ask three random Jews on the street to tell you what was the Messiah supposed to do and be, and get the same answer from all three of them. You'd get, you'd get four answers, probably. The expectation of Messiah itself is ambiguous in the scriptures. You, it's more like you get flickers of it here, flickers of it there. You, you get clear scriptures of God promising to bring salvation, of God redeeming his people, and of God installing the heir to David's throne on the throne. And, and, and when you mix them all together, you, you sort of come up with this picture of the anointed one. 
that is coming, the, the Messiah, the King. And in Isaiah, God is giving this prophecy to reassure the armies of Israel that He will give them victory and bring salvation. And Jesus is the ultimate assurance that God is with us. Amen. So when it says that the scriptures were fulfilled, it's not that this prediction finally came true after 700 years. It's saying Jesus is re it's like Jesus reliving the story of the Old Testament. And why? Well, because their story got stuck in Babylon. And Jesus is enabling it to move forward. God is with us, church. Amen. He goes before us and he comes behind us. Like it says in Psalm 139, verse 5, You hem me in, behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. And at the end of the Gospel, Jesus repeats this refrain, and he says, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. He is God with us. God is with us. God has not forgotten us, amen? He has not forgotten this church. He has not forgotten Waypoint. Do you believe that? You believe it in your bones. God has not forgotten this church. Why would he have sent anybody in 2024 if God had forgotten this church? And of all people, the Louis being part of that. Why would he send them if God had forgotten this church? He would have left Waypoint to float as if in a raft in the sea. Had God forgotten this church, he would not have sent tens and tens of thousands of dollars from the Anilo Valley Church, and from the Santa Clarita Church, and from the Valley Church, and the Ventura Church. God has not forgotten this church. God is with us. He wants us to thrive, and to succeed, and to, to heal, and to be victorious. God's pulling for us. Come on. He's sending in the big guns. He's rooting for us. He's longing for us. Amen. Do you believe that? Yes. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> His Spirit dwells amongst us. Even this moment as we are gathered in His name. Look around. It's like whisking around. I think of, I, I just imagine like a Pocahontas scene where you see the colors of the wind whisking around. That's what I imagine when I think of like the Spirit of God being there when we gather. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have sufficient faith, then I will have faith for the both of us. God brings salvation. Jesus is the bringer of salvation. He came to save his people from their sins. He is the bringer of God's liberating rescue. That's what salvation means in the Bible. And as disciples of Jesus, we get to live in this salvation. And participate in bringing salvation to others. This story shows that, that Jesus, he is the legal heir to David, that he is the son of David. That he is the king. And as disciples of the king, we do as he says. Amen? Amen. We give our lives utterly over to him. Amen? Amen. We're going on in Matthew 2. It says, In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star in the east and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him, and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them and, uh, of where the Messiah was to be born. Did I, did I read past it? Mm -hmm. Ah, there we go. What verse am I at? Five. I'm reading off. Okay, five, five. I'm at five. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Of where they started, thank you, thank you. Okay. They told him, 
in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. <laughs> when they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen in the east until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in the dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Amen. Over and over again in the Gospel of Matthew, the leaders of Israel meet Jesus with hostility and rejection. May we be found to be different. Amen. 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 Makes me think of John 1. When it says that Jesus came to his own, but his own did not receive him. Herod did not welcome Jesus. He tried to kill him, as we know later in the story. It's the pagan magi who bow down before Jesus as the king he really is. May we be like the magi in this respect. And, and magi were, I mean, not exactly upstanding people to the Jews. I mean, they were learned men in astronomy and astrology and possibly magical arts and whatnot. They were pagan through and through. But they are able to recognize this is a king. And we are to give him homage. Amen. 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 And I think it's difficult to understand at first why it says that Herod and all Jerusalem were distressed at the coming and the words of the Magi. But I think, look at it this way. Close your eyes. You are a king. You are a warrior king who has fought your way to the top. You're a shrewd political wheeler and dealer. You even executed your own wife when you suspected her of conspiring to, conspiring to have you killed. And then, one day, this shows up. Yeah, 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 we can't watch the whole thing. Yeah, she can open your eyes. The Magi traveled maybe hundreds, even maybe even thousands of miles in order to come before this king. You better believe it wasn't three guys with gold in their backpack. It, it might not have been as big of a caravan as that in Aladdin, but it was certainly something. And they traveled far in order to give honor to the king. Herod told them to search diligently for the child. And when they had found him, they were overwhelmed with joy. That's what happens when we search diligently for Jesus. They traveled far to give honor to the king, whereas Herod wouldn't even leave his palace. Doesn't that sound like us sometimes? We claim to be true disciples, but then, you know, we don't want to come to church. We don't want to leave our palace to come give honor to the king who gave us all we have and who owns all that we have and all that we are. Church, let us be like the Magi who come before King Jesus with good gifts. The gift of our money, the gift of our time, the gift of service, the gift of our whole life the gift of our heart. I don't always want to give God my gifts. I like to hold them back for myself. I don't always want to give Him my life. 
One way I like to hold back my life is in confession. I hate confessing my sins. Because I am terrified of being judged. I'm terrified of being seen as not as cool or as impressive as before in your eyes. I'm terrified of the unforgiveness of man. Let's come and give him our gifts, amen? amen. Because Jesus is king. He is the king. Amen. He is majestic and wild and free and untamed. He is just and loving and kind and good. He is the son of God. Come on, amen. So let's go to our God in prayer. Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you that we can come before you with boldness like it says in Hebrews because of what your son has done. Thank you for giving to us your son, the king. Thank you for bringing salvation from sin, for bringing an end to exile. God, I pray that you help us to give you our gifts. Thank you, Father, so much for all of your blessings, for everything that you've poured out upon us. Thank you, God, for this meal, this banquet at your table we're about to have together. Thank you for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.